I want to welcome everyone to the afternoon session today. We'll be getting started in just a second. Uh, real quickly, I'll introduce myself. I'm today's facilitator. My name is Brock Klein. I'm with um, Nabholz Construction. And um, I've known Dr. Loretta McGregor for about five years now, and I consider her one of my good friends. So um, to introduce her, Loretta Neal McGregor is the department chairperson and professor of psychology and counseling at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. She has served as chairperson at ASU for the past eight years and has taught in higher education for 25 years. She started when she was about four, so just so everybody knows. <laughs> She's a native of Hope, Arkansas. Her professional involvements include a membership in the American Psychological Association, where she's a member of Division II, the teaching of psychology. In STP, she served as the Associate Director of Society Programming for the APA Convention and on various committees. Dr. McGregor received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wachita Baptist University in Arkadelphia, where she double majored in psychology and sociology. She completed a Master of Science in General Experimental Psychology at Emporia State University and her PhD in Human Factor Psychology at Wichita State University. Uh, she and I actually graduated from Leadership Jonesboro together in 2010. She is a member of the Jonesboro Chamber and she is also a member of the Executive Board of the Rotary Club of Jonesboro. So let's welcome Dr. McGregor. Good afternoon. So can you hear me in the back? Is it too loud? Okay. I don't want to, you know, give anybody a headache by the time they leave because I have a teacher voice and when I turn it on, it's really on. Um, first, I am going to tell you that I am not going to use the podium. Um, I tend to roam, so I apologize to the cameraman right now. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I also want to thank my friend Brock for the wonderful um, introduction. And I would also like to thank the organization for inviting me to speak. I was very excited when I got the invitation. And I was like, wow, I get to hang out with a group of really professional and prominent women all day. And when you work in higher education, even though over 60% of our students are females, that is not necessarily reflected in the professoriate, and it is definitely not reflected in terms of administrators. So when it comes to department chairs and deans and provosts and presidents, um, as you go up the ladder, you see fewer and fewer women, and it is also rare that you see women of color. Um, in addition to that statement of working in higher education and not seeing a lot of women. One of the reasons I actually went into my field is because I did not see a lot of women. Right now, as a professor in psychology, I am a full professor because there is a hierarchy. I am among 1% of the population who is a female full professor because most females never make it to that final rank for some reason. Now that's a whole nother conversation. But for me, coming and doing something like this, I think is the way to help people sort of realize their full potential. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story before we get into the unanticipated consequences. And I do that because I want people to know that I did not spring from the head of Zeus full grown and as a full professor. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Hope, Arkansas. I was poor but didn't know I was poor. I had very good grandparents who did a very good job of, I think, instilling middle class values into us and shielding us from the thought of being, oh, I guess, being a victim. We were never allowed to have a mentality of being a victim. We were always required, and they didn't say this, but we were always required to do our best. 
in whatever it is we did. If we rode our bicycles, we were required to do our best <laughs> in riding our bicycles. My grandparents had a ninth grade education and a 12th grade education. They never went to college. My mother never went to college. I was the first generation college student in my family. I am the oldest of seven. Of the seven now, six of us have a degree of some sort. And of those six, three of us have graduate degrees. One has an MBA, one has a master's in education leadership, and I have a PhD in human factor psychology. Now, human factor psychology is an area that is related to business. It is not clinical and counseling psychology, so I will not counsel or give you advice afterwards <laughs> unless it's business related. <laughs> then we can talk. Um, the topic for today, the unanticipated consequences of success for women, actually came about um, during my years of mentoring young women in higher education. What I found is a number of things. Number one, I found that a lot of the young women who came into higher education were very bright. They were very intelligent young women. But they had this sort of dual thinking going on that would sometimes sabotage their success. They would come to school and they, it would be okay for them to learn and to grow, but then they would go home and they would be challenged not only by their peers who remained home, but by their family members with comments like, oh, so you went to college for one semester and you think you know everything now. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have heard that, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, so you think you could talk to me any kind of way now just because you've gone to college for two years. Don't, and mine, my favorite was, don't you try to use that psychology on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even that kind of psychologist. <laughs> but they had this sort of dual way of thinking. And I would try to encourage them that they really could go on and be successful and do the things they wanted to do. But then over the years, looking at my own career, I realized that there were issues that I ran into that I really wish someone would have warned me about. They were things that I could have never imagined in my wildest dreams. And all of my mentors and sponsors were men, so they could not tell me about them. Does anybody sort of relate to that just a little bit? There are certain things that are unique to professional women that men never think about. And even though they can mentor you and sponsor you in successful ways, they cannot tell you about some of the obstacles that you're going to face. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to run through my slides, and then hopefully afterwards we'll have a conversation about it. But if, you, if I get to a slide and you just have this burning feeling that you've been inspired to speak, do so, because I don't mind being interrupted. OK? So off we go. Here's what we're going to talk about. These are some of the things that I found that um, my mentors really could not tell me about. And I had to experience them firsthand. And I had to sort of maneuver my way through. And I was fortunate enough that I had really good peers along the way that we would also discuss some of these things. Some of the female peers that I had and colleagues we would discuss these some, of thing, some uh, sort of things. I am now considered a senior faculty member. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> I, and, and when we talk about it in higher education, we talk about early career, mid-career, and um, late career, or senior. I am now a late career faculty member, and I embrace that dearly. And yes, I do ask for my discounts with my AARP card. <laughs> but here are some of the unanticipated consequences, and we're going to go through them one by one. First, divorce rate. Divorce rates for professional women actually increase 
and are, large, and are greater than the divorce rate for non-professional women. Does that make sense? Anybody want to think about why or sort of mention why? They have the ability, well, they ha let me, I'm going to rephrase that. Uh, her comment was they have the ability to leave if they want to leave. I'm going to say they have the ability to take care of themselves. And sometimes that frightens husbands. Uh, they say things like, you don't need me. I actually, uh, my, my husband is deceased now, but um, immediately after I finished my PhD, he supported me through my entire PhD, bless his heart. Um, and six months after I finished my PhD, he divorced me. And he said, I, you know, I, I couldn't figure this one out. And then he said, well, you've always got to do, gotten to do all the things you wanted to do, and you're successful now. He said, and what do I have? He was comparing his success to my success, which was interesting because I saw this as our success, not mine versus his, but ours. And so I was shocked by that. But when I started researching, I found out that that actually happens quite often. Um, and so the numbers that I have up actually talk about graduate students. The divorce rate for women who are in graduate programs is twice the divorce rate for men, as you can see, up on entry and up on exit. So they'll either leave you in the beginning sometimes or they'll leave you in the end. <laughs> you can't win sometimes. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Number one, I am not male bashing, okay? I am, I also love statistics. I love teaching statistics, and I'm somewhat of a statistician. These are numbers, and the numbers in this case don't lie. Now, here's something that I want to point out about this. Again, I'm not male bashing. I simply wish people had told me this beforehand, because in those types of situations. It's not just one person. There are two people. And there are things that I did to contribute to the downfall of our marriage because I was focused on my degree. There is a possibility that I could have done some things differently. Now, I'm not quite sure what they are. Actually, I am, but we won't get in that. <laughs> But do you understand what I'm saying? If I had known this beforehand, maybe he and I could have had a conversation about this. We could have addressed the issue head on, and then we may not have gotten to the point where he felt he needed to compare his success to mine. Now, I don't know if that's the truth or not, um, because six months after he divorced me, then six months later he passed away. But. Again, I wish that I had known this beforehand because I may, we may have could have had a conversation about it. So I'm telling you, uh, for those people who are in that innovator group, uh, who have, you've just gotten married and you think that life is blissful and everything, have this conversation. Even those of you who are in that mid group and so on, have this conversation because if you are climbing the ladder of success, even though I'm talking about graduate school, you're still going to need to have this conversation. The value of family, okay? One of the things that I didn't think about, and um, fortunately there was divine inspiration on my behalf, and I didn't have to think about it, is the value of family. Families are deemed beneficial for professional men, but they're considered a hindrance for professional women sometimes. Um, the whole idea of when you're going to have children when you're a professional woman, you have to think about that. And men don't think about that because they don't give birth to the children. <laughs> Got an amen. They help make them <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> you know, we've gotten to the point where we really don't need their physical presence to make the child anymore. But 
they don't think about how is this going to affect my career. They go to work with their cigars and they celebrate, woo, I got a son. Ah, I got a little baby girl. Ah. And we, on the other hand, are sitting at our desk wondering when should we tell our boss that we're pregnant? Oh my God, I've got to tell them. And you sweat for two weeks. And then you try to figure out, can I go until I'm showing? <laughs> can I hold out until I'm showing? And then somebody says, hmm, Maggie, put on a little bit of weight there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for pointing out the fact that I put on weight. God, now I gotta tell them I'm pregnant. Now, men don't have to think about that. In this survey from the Women Executive um, article, Women, Executives, Health, Stress, and Success, in the Academy of Management Executive, uh, Volume 4, Issue Number 2 from 2000, they said that 20% of their female respondents decided not to have children, and 25% of their respondents postponed having children. Now, some of my mentors who are a little bit um, more senior than I am, and they helped mentor me through my progress in academia, many of them are childless because they were among the first wave of females to go into academia, and especially those women in the sciences, they do not have children because they were told in a non-specific way that if they had children, it would interfere with their ability to be a professional. I remember when I was pregnant with my second child, I was at that time, I think I was an assistant professor. So I had, I had been promoted from instructor to assistant professor. I became pregnant with my second child. And a male colleague told me, point blank, he said, you know you're not going to work like you used to. And I said, what do you mean I'm not going to work like I used to? Well, you know, when you get pregnant, you just don't have that energy and you're not going to work like you used to. And I said, OK. <laughs> I'm still going to do the work that I'm supposed to do. It's not like, and now see, here's the thing. As a female in academia, I always went above and beyond, which is expected of most of us. Most of us feel like we have to prove ourselves by going above and beyond. And so I was working like a Hebrew slave, <laughs> killing myself. <laughs> and I had to admit, he was exactly right. I was not going to do that anymore. <laughs> I am going to do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to be fat and pregnant and happy. You got a problem with it? <laughs> after I had my child, a couple of years later, he said, you know, you slacked off after you had Sean. And I said, OK, <laughs> all right, no problem. And then I found a new job. So. <laughs> a survey of top executives found that 49% of CEO, women who are CEOs um, are married, or excuse me, uh, found that 49% of women who are CEOs are married and have children compared to 84% of men. Again, almost twice as many men. Why? You guys really aren't going to talk to me? I thought, I thought the lunch was like really nice and light so you wouldn't be asleep and all that kind of stuff. Was it the card? I don't know. Exactly. Their spouses support the family because they, are, they don't have to work because they're the spouse of the CEO. So they take care of the kids while mom, who is the CEO, has to ask her husband sometimes to babysit. Again. Babysit your own children? Seriously? That's called parenting. That's what they talked about this morning. That is called parenting, not babysitting. You do not babysit. I don't babysit, so you don't get to babysit. <laughs> we are going to parent together. So women have this thing where they, can't, they don't have the same luxury as their male counterparts. Quite often over the years, both when I was married and when I was sing as a single person, I always said, I need a wife. 
I need a wife. And if my wife comes in the form of a man, that's fine. I just want to call him wife. <laughs> Look, wifey, I need you to go to the laundromat, pick up the laundry. I need you to pick up some groceries. And by the way, what's for dinner? <laughs> you know, I just need a wife. Men, they have that luxury of having a wife. We don't have that luxury because we are the wife and we still have to work. So, speaking of being the wife and having to work, um, housework. Males, on average, work 47 minutes longer every day at work. So they're almost at work an hour longer. And why are a lot of females not at work an hour longer? Yep, that's because they got to pick up the kids and go by the laundromat and decide what's for dinner. <laughs> And if you ask, if you're married and you ask your spouse, now not all spouses, okay, not all spouses, but a lot of spouses, if you ask them to plan dinner, it's like you've just asked them to rotate the world on its axis. Did you have a question? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you raised your hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, look at housework. 52 minutes per day for women, 16 minutes per day for men. <laughs> that's a good one. That, <laughs> that's looking for the remote and taking out the trash twice a week. <laughs> Honey, can you take out the trash? I just took it out on Wednesday. Oh, today's Sunday. I don't have a spouse, but I have a 19-year-old son and this is him, and I am trying to break him of this because I do not want his wife to be spending 52 minutes a week, a day during, home, uh, during work while he's sitting around looking for the remote and complaining about taking out the trash. He is not happy with me most of the time. He washes dishes. Okay, let's be honest. He puts the dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> and he leaves the pans sitting on the side of the counter because mom mysteriously washes those in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, I have a daughter as well. My kids are 10 years apart. She is the 52 minute per day housework. Both of them work. She comes home and she has become sort of my surrogate. She does a lot of the stuff that I used to do and she gets so angry at her brother because of the 16 minutes. He never does anything. He doesn't want to do this. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. But it's reality. Child care. Um, again, this is from 2012. Gender divides remain in housework and child care from U.S. News World and Report. Mothers spend on average 1.22 hours per day, almost an hour and a half, on child care. 52 minutes for dads. So, because they babysit. Um, the Pew Research Center did a report called Breadwinner Moms in 2013. And one of the questions they ask in their report is, it's generally better for a marriage if the husband earns more money than the wife. And what I put up is I put up um, a few numbers. Number one, in 1997, 40% of the respondents overall, regardless of gender, agreed with this comment. 40%. In 2013, that number had gone down to 28%. So I think that's a good thing. Also in 2013, notice that there's very little difference between male and female respondents. 37% versus 38%. 62%, 63% disagree with this statement. They really don't think that men have to be the major breadwinner. In 2011, um, researchers found that wives who have more education of the wives who had more education, 38% of those wives had higher incomes than their husbands. And that of spouses who had the same amount of education, 
23% of the wives make more money than their husband. So going back to that other, it shows that there is some agreement with men and women that it's okay if the female becomes the number one breadwinner now. I think one of the best trends that I've sort of seen, and I don't know if I should say the best, one that I actually appreciate, are stay-at-home dads. Men who are willing to take the responsibility of rearing their children day in and day out and allowing their wives to be the breadwinner because they realize she's got it going on. She's going to bring home the most money and the bacon and the dry cleaning. And I just have to watch Junior here and play with him all day. Now, actually, they do more. But I, I really like seeing that type of equity. We don't have a lot of it, but I do like it when I see it. I know this is hard to see, but we're talking about men and women and their income and people thinking, I, I don't think, I don't know, does it help? Okay, thank you. Um, men and women and their income and thinking that it's okay to actually have women make more money, but in reality, look at what women make on average compared to men. For every dollar that a man makes, this shows you what a woman makes in comparison state by state. In the state of Arkansas, for every dollar made by a man, a woman makes 77 cents. 77 cents. 79 cents in Texas, yes. I'm sorry, no. That does um, include women who are also in poverty, but it is primarily job for job, because you do have women who are also doing some of the same low-paying jobs as men are paid. But you do also have more women who are in poverty. So when you actually combine those two, you find that women are making less money on average than men are. Thank you, very good question. So when you talk, one of the other things that you'll find is that there are differences in the workplace regarding what's considered barriers uh, for men and women. Women and men look at the workplace in a very different way. One of the things you'll find is that if you ask men, what are some of the barriers to women in the workplace? Notice that the men are in green. They think the primary barriers is that they haven't been working long enough. This is why they don't get promoted, or this is why they don't get certain jobs, because they haven't been working long enough. And because they haven't been working long enough, they have a lack of experience. And this is not true, because what you find in the workplace is quite often you will find women who have been working just as long as men, and they 